गुड आफ्टरनून वन एंड ऑल लेट्स फर्स्ट वेलकम डॉक्टर शैलेश कुमार ओके डॉक्टर शैलेश कुमार इज द चीफ डेटा साइंटिस्ट एट रिलायंस जियो ही सर्व एज अ विजिटिंग फैकल्टी ऑफ मशीन लर्निंग एट इंडियन स्कूल ऑफ बिजनेस प्रायर टू दिस ही वॉज अ डिस्टिंग्विश साइंटिस्ट एट ओला को फाउंडर एट थर्ड लीप एंड एट टेक ए आई कंपनी एंड मैनी मोर विथ ओवर एटीन ईयर्स ऑफ एक्सपीरियंस इन नेचुरल लैंग्वेज अंडरस्टैंडिंग दैट इज एन एल यू स्पीच अंडरस्टैंडिंग कंप्यूटर विजन बायो इन्फॉर्मेटिक्स रिमोट सेंसिंग फ्लीट मैनेजमेंट रिटेल डेटा माइनिंग एड टेक आई ओ टी फाइनेंस इंश्योरेंस एंड हेल्थ केयर ही हैज पब्लिश ओवर ट्वेंटी कॉन्फ्रेंस पेपर्स जर्नल पेपर्स एंड बुक चैप्टर्स एंड होल्ड्स अबाउट ट्वेंटी पेटेंट्स इन दीज एरियाज रिकग्नाइज एज वन ऑफ द टॉप टेन डेटा साइंटिस्ट इन इंडिया इन टू थाउजेंड फाइव इन टू थाउजेंड फिफ्टीन सॉरी एंड टॉप फिफ्टी अनालिटिक्स लीडर्स इन इंडिया इन टू थाउजेंड एटीन बाय द अनालिटिक साइंस मैगजीन He has received his PhD and Masters in Computer Science from the University of Texas in Austin, and B.Tech in Computer Science from IIT Varanasi. So, have a big round of applause for <laughs> Dr. Thank you. Thank you. Have you downloaded it already? Hello. Yeah. Better. All right. Yeah. Huh? Yeah. yeah. All right. So we'll get started. Yeah. Okay. So thanks for inviting me. I think uh, you know we've been. I've been trying to come here, and uh, we could never make time. So finally, we made time. so it's a it's a pleasure to be here i wanted to share some of my insights that i've learned over the last 20 years sort of i grew up with the field right i got lucky and i got into it at the right time and sort of you know so it went there so i'm going to talk about this idea of evolution of ai thinking right so and when i say ai thinking what does that mean is so if you look at uh, your own um, object oriented thinking right the first time you wrote a program which was object oriented your idea of programming evolved right or first time you will write your spark job or my hadoop job your idea of computing will evolve right so every time we do something we kind of evolve our thinking process so in the same spirit you know the idea of what is ai and what is ai thinking will evolve as we start thinking about where we are where we have been what are the new next generation products we have to build right so in that context context we'll go through this exercise right So let me give you a perspective on technology, right? So I think the slides are a little off, but so the idea is, you know, if you think about what is technology, technology is really an extension of who we are, right? So if I cannot see very far, I create a telescope. If I cannot uh, see very deep, I create a microscope. If I cannot talk to somebody on the other side, we create a telephone network, right? If we cannot lift heavy things, we create a crane. So the idea is, that at a very fundamental level, technology is just a way to extend our own capabilities. into machines beyond our own capabilities right now what is it that we really want to extend so it's very easy to extend our you know ability to see and hear and walk and lift and all that those things others do too right other animals do what is so special about humans which is what we want to extend with technology right so we build cars because we cannot walk fast enough but that's fine but is there anything special about us that we also want to extend and that is our intelligence our ability to learn our ability to think to create to understand right so those are also the abilities we want to extend through technology and the benefits of all that is why we are all here right so we see the benefits and and the perils of it and all that right so that is one perspective the other perspective i want to share is if you think about the journey of any startup or a company or a large company or a civilization it takes these four stages if you If you look at all the countries in the world today, or all the companies in the world today, or all the startups in the world today, 
they are at one of these four stages. So they start as an infrastructure company, right? So when Ola started, it will say, oh, I need to get people onboarded on the driver side. I need to pull this infrastructure together. I need to build an app, right? Uh, when Google started, it said, oh, I need to download web pages. I need to be able to uh, so automate a bunch of things. So this is all infrastructure. The first thing we do is we build infrastructure. Then what happens? We realize that, okay, now I cannot scale without automation, right? I cannot take calls and connect people manually. I need an automated system, right? So then we start to automate our processes. And this is where IT starts. So this is the beginning of IT on top of the infrastructure, right? So building of apps and what have you. Right? So, so that's where most of the companies are that, you know, if you look at, you know, food delivery apps and others, they build the infrastructure, people on the ground, a process and all that. They build apps and you can get things done. Now what happens after a few years of that is we start collecting a lot of data, right? Who is ordering what kind of food? Who is going from which place to which place? Who is calling home at what time of day? You know, what kind of apps are you using on the phone? So then we start to collect a lot of data over a period of time and then we start to realize, okay, you know, why did I actually want to collect the data in the first place? So initially when you are an engineer and building an app, why do you collect the data? Is to debug something. So you have logs that tell you that when this call happened, this was the response and I need that for debugging purposes, right? Then you say, oh, you know what? I also have to report to the VC or to the CEO how many people came to the... Uh, to my website today, right? How many new customers are there? So then I use the same data from debugging to reporting. So I, I use the same data to report something, right? Then the next transition happens and say, oh, if I can debug and report, can I do something more with this data? Can I go back and improve my system, what I coded up earlier as IT, right? The fixed IT kind of system. Can I now improve it with this data? And that is the birth of a transition of a data company to an AI company, right? And, you know, Google made that transition at some point, Reliance will make it at some point, Ola made it at some point. Every company is making these transitions now. They're going from infrastructure to automation to data to AI companies, right? And this is where we come in, which says, hey, now that you're sitting on all this data, what can we do with it? To go back and improve your hard-coded IT systems into learning systems, right? That's what we do, right? Okay. All right, so uh, I think we cannot see the slides very well, but okay. So I'll read the titles if we have to. So the, the, you know, the technology is evolving very quickly in all, all facets, right? So if you look at, um, is a, I think it's not working. So you know, our tools are evolving, our sensors are evolving, our computing and our data is evolving, our interfaces are evolving, and our in idea of intelligence is also evolving. Not our intelligence, but what intelligence is, right? All these things are evolving in the last 10 years, and I want to give you a little bit of that perspective. And obviously, our idea of what is a great product is also evolving, and therefore, the idea of AI thinking is also evolving. Right? So we're going to see some of this in an in a evolution sense. What do we mean by all these things are evolving? Right? So if you look at the evolution of the tools, right? so technology is not something that we started building in the last five years. Right? Mankind has been doing, you know, Tir Command is a technology. right? Uh, acts as a technology. So remember, technology is anything that helps me do a better job, right? Okay. So you know, the idea of tools has evolved quite a bit, right? So since the mankind started till now, the idea of what a tool is, you know, this, this device that captures the video is a tool, right? Uh, and all that. So tools have evolved. If you look at uh, our idea of sensors has evolved, right? So if you look at the first sensor that we made on on astronomy and then you know how that evolved into now we can send a satellite into space we send hundreds of satellites every day uh, and all that and then you know the sensors have evolved in every field right medical sensors have become much better right satellite centers can actually the spy satellites can read your number plate in the car from from the sky right if you've seen movies like enemy of the state and all that right uh, there are sensors for agriculture right soil sensors can tell you soil health right there are sensors for everything. Fitbit is a sensor. And the good news is we are also all sensors. Have you think, uh, thought of yourself as a sensor yet? No? Okay. So what is a sensor? Anything that generates a data point is a sensor. Okay. Now, whenever you make a phone call, you generate a data point in somebody's log. 
whenever you buy something, whenever you swipe a card, whenever you like a post, whenever you click something on Google or watch a video, everything is creating a log entry somewhere. Therefore, now we have billions of people who are also sensors and you know, now you know, your phones have sensors that can tell you when you are sleeping, when you are doing whatever, right? So the idea is sensor as a concept is evolving, the idea of a sensor is evolving, right? And I tell people that you know, today in today's world, don't think of your app or the service or the product you are building as something that is a service that you are giving to somebody. Think of it as a sensor you are building for collecting data. So th the app actually plays two roles now, which are both equally important. And why would somebody give you data unless you give them service, right? So the idea is, think of you know, your, your data collection strategy is far more important than how your UI looks. You know, make sure we are collecting, you know, using the app correctly. So I'll give you examples of why sensor thinking is very important. Okay, we have seen computing evolving, right? And you know, uh, obviously there was a time when IBM said, who's gonna need a computer, right? Uh, the world doesn't need infinite computers, it only needs five. And you know, then Microsoft came and everybody had a PC. And then what happened? The idea of computers evolved. At some point, we realized that a computer is not big enough for what I want to do, right? I want to store millions of videos and images at home, I cannot store them on my hard disk, right? So I need a Google Photos or something. I can't store my email here, so I need a Gmail. Then I have a LinkedIn, then I have a YouTube. So now, what is your real computer? Is not the thing you carry around. The real computer is the cloud, and you use your devices to connect to it. That's where your Gmail, YouTube, everything sits. So the idea of computers has evolved, right? And we need to make that conscious transition of what we thought was a computer back when we were kids to now, it has evolved, right? And obviously this will continue to evolve to quantum and other things, yeah? The idea of data has evolved, right? So when I was studying, people would complain that, uh, oh, there is too much data. There are 10,000 rows in an Excel spreadsheet and back in the day, there was not enough memory to do anything with it. So back then we used to com complain about too little data, too, too much data, right? And now also we compute about too much data, right? So, or too little data, depending on which side of the spectrum you are, right? So complaining on data is always a good uh, practice for a data scientist, right? But the idea is that the, uh, the amount of data we are generating now is, is a lot in every domain, right? And uh, once you start working in different domains and you start to see the amount of data being generated, it's just mind boggling, right? It is not even funny. And you know, Eric Schmidt said that, uh, in 2003 or 2013, he said that we are generating as much data in one day now that we have generated since the birth of humanity till now. That is the amount of data we are generating one day and it's going to go even exponential, right? So look at, you know, the Human Genome Project was a huge amount of data generated of a certain kind, satellite data. Every now and then satellites rotate, we sleep but the satellites are still collecting data, right? We don't know what to do with it. It has become too much to know what to do with it, right? Banks are collecting data, right? Retailers are collecting data, stock market, buy and sell, everywhere, right? And your internet has completely changed that scenario to 100 times more data, right? I talked about clicks and likes and everything. And then the new thing that is the IoT coming up, imagine every light, today it's not a sensor, it is not generating data. But tomorrow these lights will come with uh, a ping that says, I'm here, I'm still here, right? And then it'll say, you know, I'm consuming this much electricity and I'm about to die in another 20 days, right? So it's going to generate that kind of data, right? And we'll be able to collect it, right? So IoT is, is and, and you know, in all, all devices, you know, lights, fans, cars, you know, refineries everywhere, right? All right, so uh, we understand now data, sensor, all that is evolving. Think about interfaces now, right? So the idea of interface is also evolving. If you look at the very gory interfaces which are very rich in swipe and touch and clicks and menus and all that, right? We grew up in the Windows era where they had all these file, menu, edit and all that, right? So we still think that is an interface. And therefore we need to now, you know, use those kind of interfaces. But how do we interface with each other? We don't download an app for every person and say, wait, let me download an app to talk to you and then let me go swipe and click there. We just talk to each other. We understand facial expressions. We understand gestures when I say this and this, right? 
and Indian no's are very complex. Everybody knows that, right? Or Indian yeses are very complex, right? So gestures, eyes, you know, speech, language, hand waving, right? All this is interface, right? So the idea of interface with the machines should also become as natural as with each other, right? So now we are getting into what we call conversational interfaces, right? But now, you know, 70% of India doesn't know how to type, let alone English, right? How will you access to those people? So then we have newer interfaces, right? Speech. So, you know, the idea of what is an interface is evolving very quickly, right? Your Fitbit is an interface and it collects data constantly and it gives you a lot of value back, right? So everything is an interface in that sense. Tomorrow we'll have facial recognition sensors everywhere and you will not have to even do anything. You just walk straight to the, uh, to the aeroplane because there are cameras that do facial recognition and they let you go through security, right? All that process that we go through in airports, right, will go away. Boarding pass and check, five times you have to check, right? Uh, I don't know why, <laughs> right? So the idea of an interface will change. The idea of knowledge is also evolving. So let me give you a, another philosophical idea of how do we think about an AI system versus a, a software engineering system, right? So, uh, you know, let me uh, start with this. So, so there is a reality out there, right, that we are trying to understand. Don't think of AI system, think of yourself. How do we operate in this world, right? So there's a reality of the world and what do we get out of that reality is a sample of it, right? So, you know, your daily life is a sample of the actual reality of the world, right? So that is the data that you get. Somebody else gets some other data. Person growing up in a village gets another data. So they have their own idea of what reality is, right? And then what do we do? We use this data to discover new knowledge and to refine existing knowledge. What does that mean? So if I have a kid who has never seen, a, uh, let's say, a goat before, and I take her to a zoo and she sees a goat, and she says, what is that? It looks like a dog. Then we say, no, no, that's not a dog, it's a goat. You all study classification, right? And it's a goat. And then she says, oh, there's another category that I didn't know about. So I discover new knowledge. This is called discovering new knowledge, right? And then we come home and we see a nice little poodle dog. And she says, is this the dog or is it a cat? And then you say, no, no, this is also a dog. Then what do we do? We refine the idea of a dog. I knew that there is something called a dog. When I see a new kind of a dog that I've never seen before, I expand the idea of a dog, right? So I refine my knowledge and I collect knowledge. So that's what the data does to me. So every time I watch a, another funny, crazy YouTube video, my idea of what is a dance evolves, for example, right? So this is the data to knowledge loop. And then what do we do with this knowledge? We generalize that knowledge. We say, okay, duck is also a bird and all birds fly, then maybe duck should also fly, right? And we wait for the duck to fly, throw stones at it. Anyway, that's what kids do. We experiment and we make sure that our idea of the real world matches what we believe it is, right? Now, if it was just an input-output system, it would be easy. But AI systems are not input-output systems. They are a looping system. Now, the knowledge I have acquired so far, my customer understanding of the customer, my understanding of languages, my understanding of uh, retail environment, right? The knowledge I have gathered so far helps me interpret new data that I see. And that's the crux of this whole thing, that up till today, whatever your life experience is, quote unquote, data is, is, is given you a certain model of the world, right? And now tomorrow when you wake up, you start to see new data, you try to project that data and interpret it with the knowledge that you have so far. And that's what we do. And we interpret and say, this is not important, that is important, pay attention to this, why is a motorcycle in the room? Because your previous knowledge tells you that this is weird, this is okay, this is not correct, right? So that's what we do. So think of this loop. AI is not installed. AI is improved over time, right? And that's one of the big transitions that a lot of CEOs don't get it. They think, Arey, yaar, I called the TCS guys, they installed all my IT software, and it starts to work every, you know, to the to next day. Why is it that you took so much money, did some AI thing, and it's still not working? Because AI is like a baby that grows, AI is not a system that you install, right? That's an important distinction we have to educate ourselves and everybody that it's okay to, to get 50% accuracy on your first attempt, right? It's okay to do that. So it's a loop, yeah? All right. Now, 
you know, another area that a lot of people are confused about is what is this business intelligence and artificial intelligence and machine learning and data science and data mining. There are like 200 uh, terms that we have come up with, right? So let me give you a some, some uh, my, my understanding of this, right? So when I say business intelligence, I really mean reporting the past in all fancy ways. Beautiful tableau charts, you know, this happened, then that happened, correlations histograms, pie charts, right? Reporting the past is business intelligence in my mind. Some human has to look at that and then make a guess of what to do next, right? But you are only reporting the past. But that's not how we work, right? I, I don't look at the rear window and, and drive my car forward. What do we do? We don't just report the past, we, we predict the future, right? So if I say, if I press the lift, you know, will the lift come or not, I make that prediction before I take the action. If I cross the road, will I reach the other side or not, I make the prediction before I start doing it, right. We do not live in the world of the past, we live in the world of the prediction, right. So that is the birth of machine learning. So if you have seen enough data, you build cause and effect relationships and then you are able to predict, right. That, you know, every mother knows that next time when the rains will come and the construction will happen, my kid will start to sneeze again because I have seen the cause and effect before. So that is machine learning. Now knowing that this is going to happen, is that enough? So you go in the morning and say I am a machine learning expert, here is a list of customers I know will about to churn and you give him that list of customers, is that enough? Are you done? No, right? Prediction is not enough, what do we do next? Is we take some actions on top of those predictions, right? So data science is really the industrial version of machine learning which is an academic exercise. You understand? Predicting is like science, data science is like engineering. So if I can predict cause and effect of gravity and flow and sunlight and all that, that is science, right? But if I can use that to build systems like an aeroplane or a car, then it is data science, right? How do you take action on top of predictions, right? And then, you know, AI is really not about um, a dot .ai domain name, right? Today, uh, everybody has a dot .ai, right? So there's live.ai and xyz.ai, right? So everybody is a dot .ai company. But the, the original idea of AI was that can you not just look at the current situation and make a current tactical thing, but can you look at all possible futures and then decide what to do now? So the, think about it this way, when you play chess, you do not say, okay, what is possible, what looks good now? You say, if I play this, he will play that, then I play this, then I lose the game, then I try another, then I try other. Before I make the first move, I explore all possibilities. And that is what AI lets you do, it explores all possibility. Now, why is AI so much more important than other things? If you look at every important decision that you take is a, has an effect on the next state that you are going to land up in, right? So the idea of education, of career building, of agriculture, of health, these are all long term uh, you know, repercussions of every action you take now, right? So therefore these are all actually sequential decision processes, not the current decision process, right? Customer lifetime value is an AI problem, it is not a, just a prediction problem, it is a sequence of prediction problem, right? So understand that AI is a different kind of thing than just uh, this thing, right? All right, so let's talk about evolution of decision. So if I have to explain to my grandmother what is AI, what does it do really, right? How is it different from IT, right? Oh, you also code, they also code. What is your coding different than there? How does it benefit them? So what does IT do? It makes errors less, it makes automation more, it scales, it removes people and, you know, manual to automation. That's what IT does. What does AI do is what I'm going to tell you now, right? So one, uh, one thing it does, it helps us make whatever we call better decision. So what is a better decision? So if you think about it, one kind of notion of better is from broadcast to personalized decision. Now, now we are seeing this transition now that your home screen of Netflix is different than somebody else's, right? Your home screen of Geo Cinema is different from somebody else's. Your home page on Yahoo is different from somebody else's, right? Obviously your Gmail is different from others is not a big deal, right? But the common things are also different, this is personal. Now if you look at one of the most important systems that is a broadcast system that needs to be personalized is the education system for example, right? 
So our education system is a broadcast decision right now. Some guys in Delhi got together and wrote up a book called an NCRT book of physics for class 10th. And now that one book, all these hundreds of thousands of kids have to read. And by the way, they all are different. Some learn visually, some learn in a different way. Some are ahead, some are behind. Some have uh, the prerequisite, some don't. Some like the language, some don't. There's so much diversity and you're forcing one textbook on everybody. You understand the problem? Same thing with medicine, right? Why would the same medicine work on everyone? Why should the farmer give the same fertilizer to every crop? Shouldn't it depend on the crop? Not the field, just the crop. So the idea of personalization can help us build much better precision decisions than broadcast decisions, right? So that's one thing that AI does. Second thing what it does, it, it, because of compute, it can now do a very real-time decisions, right? So you walk into a store and you buy a printer and uh, your receipt gets printed. Now behind the receipt, if I can print a coupon for cartridge, because you just bought printer, how do I know this? Because I have seen the data or I have domain knowledge. You see real time, right? In education, one of the big problems is teacher gives you a homework today, you do it tomorrow, you submit the copy, then she takes three days to correct. Five days later, you get to know what you did. By the time, you know, a lot of water has flown under the bridge, as they say, right? You have watched three cricket games, you have done all this other nonsense. You have no idea what that thing is. So without real-time feedback, education is not going to work. That's why we need tutors now, right, who can tell me exactly this step is wrong right away. So this idea of real-time versus batch is very important, right? Another thing that AI does is it lets you be proactive and not be reactive. Today, you know, when a farmer commits a suicide, then we react to it. When there is a drought that has already happened, we react to it. When a kid has failed in school, we react to it. When we fall sick, we react to it. Can we actually predict and be proactive and say, how do I prevent this from ever happening, right? And that's what, you know, if you can predict, you can prevent, right? So that is the idea of healthcare, education, agriculture. All these areas can be proactively taken care of, right? Uh, and the last thing AI does is it helps you make what we call strategic decisions and not tactical decisions. Now, what's a strategic and a tactical decision? I'll give you two examples, right? So imagine if you're a farmer and you are under a lot of debt and you want to grow a crop and you want to grow a crop that is going to yield a lot of revenue for you and you think that adding a lot of fertilizers is good, adding a lot of pesticide is good, make sure it is the best crop possible. So you made a tactical decision of this crop. What have you done for the long term? You have destroyed your you know, soil and other things, right? Same thing in education. We have to pass the next exam. Do everything just to pass the next exam and then baat ki dekhi jayegi, right? And then what happens? We don't know the fundamentals and we cross and we pass IIT and then we still don't know a certain thing, right? Why? Because we are taking a sequence of tactical decisions, right? So all these, you know, career building, education, farming, healthcare, these are all strategic decisions. One example I'll give you from Ola days. Imagine a, in a, you know, a, a driver has not made enough money in the day, right? He should have made 500 rupees. He has only made 200 so far. And he's sitting in a certain location here in Hiranandani, right? Now, imagine, you know, five customers are looking for a ride. Five pinks come. So Ola looks at these five customers and they say, this is the driver who is available. What to do? Who should I assign? So one customer is going to the airport. So it's a long ride from here. And it's going to give him a lot of revenue because if you assign him to that guy, Another customer is going to some weird place, very long, maybe, I don't know, between Pune and Mumbai, somewhere in a remote area. It's a very long ride. It's going to give him a lot more money, but he's going to be stuck there for the whole two days. Now, if I were making a tactical decision just to improve the next objective function and not looking at what happens next, and this wisdom is there in all the auto wallas. They'll say, waan se sabari nahi milta hai. You've seen this many times, right? This wisdom is there, people think strategically, right? And can we make AI systems think strategically, right? So that's the idea. So you understand that AI can help you do all these things, right? So AI is obviously evolving and you're studying a lot of courses that give you this insight that now we can convert data into insights, it's not just data, right? Tableau reports and all that. 
you don't have to encode the rules, you can actually learn the rules, right? Uh, you know, hearing is listening, looking is seeing now, right? Your cameras can actually tell you that, you know, that third guy from the right was not smiling, take this picture again, right? So now the cameras will be able to do that. You know, uh, reading is understanding. So if you look at Google search first, what was Google search doing? It was thinking that every word in every document is just some word, some ID, and it built a search engine. Then it realized the world is actually not made up of documents and videos and tweets and, and blogs. The world is actually made up of people and entities and events and things and their attributes. So there is a real world and there is a virtual world. right? And it is the extraction of the real world from the virtual data is what matters. Not searching the words that somebody is typing, understanding what he is saying is what matters. So the whole idea of text to understanding, right? Speech to understanding, all of that, right? All right. So AI is evolving quite a bit, and now we are at a five-year-old stage. So we are at a stage where AI can do all the basic things to 70, 80 percent accuracy. Obviously, it has a long way to go, but now we are ready to build products for the next level, and that is what we need to start thinking. So one is yes, there will be people who will continue to improve text understanding vision and speech and this and that but what we need to start thinking is how do I take all these building blocks and create next generation of products and what would they look like right all right so so let's look at this idea of evolution of a product itself right so if you think about you know you talk to your grandparents and ask them this question what is the great product of your times what would they say huh Radio, yes, right? All India radio, every language, no, whatever, Bharti, and then, you know, whatever, right? Okay. What else? Landline. Landline, right? The phone, a landline was a big deal at that. Okay. TV, right? TV, probably our parents' generation thought TV was a great invention, right? Tube well, tractor, you know, in the villages, there were all these things. So, those are great products. And then our parents' generation, we started growing up with these products, right? So, we'll call them product 1.0. The idea was, these are the products that we expect, these are what we call, uh, you know, physical products, not, not virtual products, physical products. And what is the expectation from these products is reliability, right? My car should not break down every now and then, my TV should not break down, my radio should not break down, all of that, right? We are still continuing to improve these products. But these are the products of our parents' generation. What are the products of our generation? Last 10 years, 15 years, what are the new kinds of products we have done? We have obviously improved the cars, but we have built a completely different class of products altogether. Any ideas? Pardon? Smartphone. Smartphone is still a physical product, right? It's just an improvement over the physical phone, right? The other phone. It is smart, it's a it's an incremental product in that sense. You do this every morning, you wake up and you do this. Right? You use Google Maps, for example, or you use Google search, or you use YouTube, or you use LinkedIn. Right? So this is what we call product 2.0. They were not just better versions of 1.0, they were completely different, right? A whole different class of products. And you know, uh, they are all what we call virtual products, right? They are mostly online. And the good news is, these products taught us how to take one idea like search or advertising or recommendation engine or link prediction, right? Social network. Take one idea and scale it to the planet, right? So these products didn't do like, you know, a, you know, a complete solution of something. But they focused on one thing and took it all the way and said, let's scale, let's improve, let's scale, let's improve. The other thing we learned from them is that AI is not done in isolation. Nobody does AI separately and gives it to you. Unless people participate in the process, if you stop using Google today, Google will become dumber and dumber and dumber over time. It is our clicks that make Google smart. If LinkedIn recommends somebody, and you take it or not, that feedback makes LinkedIn smart. YouTube recommendation, if you don't click on it, it becomes, you know, you make it smart. So the, the idea is, it's a, it's a, you know, symbiosis between the users and the AI simultaneously, right? 
So these are the insights we learned about what is an AI product, how do we build it at scale, right? Now tell me what are the product 3.0 going to look like? Will they be just better versions of Google, right? And say, hey Google, do something which I would have done by typing anyway, right? Or would it be something different? as drastically different than what we saw from 1 to 2. We already started talking about them, right? There are conferences on them. No? Hyperloop. Huh? Hyperloop. Hyperloop is an example, but it's just a plus plus version of a train, right? It's not really a, a different kind of product, right? No? Space, travel. space travel, right? Space travel is again an extension of airline industry, right? So certain things are going in a direction, but what is the leap from? So I'll give you an example. So, so in my mind, the product 3.0 are what we call ecosystem intelligence products, okay? So the idea is uh, imagine a connected car ecosystem or a smart city. Think of a smart city as a product, okay, of the future that Cisco's and Google's and you know, everybody has to come together to build. No one company can build that product, right? Connected homes, connected cars, ecosystem product. Now, why are they different than this one? So, what happens now in Google is we interact with Google directly and we make, as a collective, we make these products better, right? Now, what will happen if I have connected car ecosystem? What will happen then? How is that intelligence different from crowdsource in intelligence? What will happen then is, I want you to think about this scenario, right? Today when you commute to work or home, what do you do? You plan like crazy, right? Are seven o'clock ho gaya nikalna hai, right? And it will be delayed and this and that will happen. So we plan like crazy to do this. And each one is optimizing their own commute time, right? And each one is making their own decision without telling everybody else what they made the decision. And what is the effect of that? We all are trying to optimize our local optimal problems, but what is the result of that? You know, the, the, the theaters are full, the roads are full, the malls are full, everything is full at the same time, right? So there's a problem with this kind of thinking. Now imagine if all the connected cars got together on the cloud virtually, right? And they said, oh, my boss wants to go here at that time, your boss wants to go there at that time. Let's run a global optimization, right? And say, if if this guy starts at this time and takes this route, he starts at this time, takes that route. And if we do a global optimization for everybody, together our overall commute times will come down. You understand that today machines are talking to humans. Now imagine machines are talking to machines, right? Your fridge talking to the, to the Amazons and saying, you know, order this. And then big basket guy delivers it and he charges from your door, right? That whole thing, machines talking to machines, so that we don't have to have, you know, book a yatra, then book a cab, then go there, right? Everything gets done. So, so, so the idea is now we're going to go to that kind of products, and how do we build those kind of products, right? So I'll give you some examples. So if you think about e-commerce, e-commerce is one example of what I call a hybrid product, right? You do something online and something physical happens, right? Ola, Uber is a hybrid product. You do something virtual, something physical happens. Google is not a hybrid product, right? LinkedIn is not a hybrid product, unless you get a job out of LinkedIn, right? Then it's a hybrid product. So you understand that uh, these products take a lot of different kinds of AI algorithms to come together as a collective, as a single ecosystem to work together, right? And that's when a product 3.0 gets created. Another one of my favorite examples is what I call a teaching machine. So a teaching machine is, you know, you know, in India, there's a very big gap between teacher-student ratio, right? We all are here, we speak English, we live in a city, but there's a lot of rest of India which is, does not have all of this. So how do we scale education to the masses? Obviously, we can use the internet and all this, but how do I do it in all languages? How do I do it when the kid is ready to learn? How do I make it adaptive to the kid, right? So the idea is there's a lot of potential in, in building a new kind of a education system which can recognize what a kid, imagine a kid is writing in a digital slate and you can understand what he's writing, language, OCR, speech, all that. You could profile every kid and say, oh, this is what he knows, he doesn't know, this he can apply, he doesn't know how to apply, 
this he can retain, not retain, this is the kind of mistakes he make. How will we get that, right? And then use all that profiling to do a lot of personalization, right? You are a visual kid, I'm not going to give you this boring video like in three idiots, right? What is a machine? Definition kya hai, right? I'm not going to give you that, I'm going to give you some nice fancy video, right? Something like that. So you are an abstract thinker, I'm going to give you a different kind of video, right? How do I personalize curriculum? How do I personalize content? How do I personalize the problem that you're ready to do next? So imagine I know your state and I say this kid, if I give him this problem, what is the probability he'll be able to solve it? If the probability is 0.1 or 0.9, I don't want to give you that problem. It's too easy or too difficult. I want to give you that problem, which is 0.5. And that's exactly what a great teacher would do. He will take, you know, he will understand you completely, teach you the way you like to learn, give you exactly the right level of difficulty of the problem. And he will know that you're not able to solve the third step. Therefore, you probably don't know that concept. He'll drop this, go back there, teach you that and come back here. This is personalized education. What do we do today? Oh, bacho, book kolo, chapter kolo, and then we blah, 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 right? And everybody is like watching this whole drama going on, right? And then you ask the kids, why do you want to not go to school? And say, I can learn more at uh, home, right? And all that. So there's a lot to be done on personalization, like I said, broadcast to personalization, right? And then how can we make machines a lot more human, right? Can they understand speech and gestures and all that? So now all these building blocks are almost there. Right? And we just have to put them together. And that's a product 3.0 thinking that how do we not worry about learning how speech is done or how this is done. Can we start thinking about the big issues and come up with a complete product idea which can scale to the Indian context or whatever context, right? All right. So, you know, to build such things, our AI thinking has to evolve, right? And that's what the key message is here. So, if you look at all the old companies, and I'm going to count Google and Reliance are old companies, right? Banks are old companies, right? So what they do, they, they said, oh, I need customer acquisition model, I need a lot of customers. So they built a market segmentation model, right? So that's model one sitting somewhere, written in COBOL 20 years ago, right? Then after some time, they got a lot of customer and then banking changes and they said, oh, I want a lot of, you know, credit scoring models now. I want to know who to give loan to. So they built another system written in some uh, SaaS or whatever, that's your second model, right? Sybil model, if you will. Then they said, oh, you know, I want to be able to cross-sell by one loan and another loan. And so then I built a cross-sell model or something, another model come, written in Java now, right? And then somebody said, oh, you know, customers are churning and what to do? I built a churn prediction model written in Spark, right? You see the journey of both technology and the models built in isolation as they discovered the need, right? That's how Google search is different, Google ad is different, Google inbox recommendation is different, YouTube is different. They're all silos. These models are not yet talking to each other, right? So that's the old style of AI thinking, which is it's a collection of models. It is not. If you really think about it, it's really a, a ecosystem of models. And I'll give you an example. Why I, like, you know, when I joined from Google to Ola, I, I really felt that transition, that I cannot do the same thing I did there in Ola. And why is it so? Is because to solve a fleet management problem, right? You have to understand your customers. You have to understand your drivers. You have to understand locations and times based on demand and supply of cabs, right? You have to understand your competitor. You have to understand weather. You know, in heat, people take more cabs than normal in rain. You have to understand so many things to then think about how do you solve this entire problem. And then you have to build models for customer understanding, driver understanding, location understanding, then deciding how to do allocation. I just gave you an example of allocation, right? How do you allocate which cab? And then you have to do, you know, is the driver fraud? Is he safe? Is it a woman uh, passenger? All of that you have to take into account. So you have to know so much about so many things and they all have to interact with each other. And that's how, you know, it, it kind of pushed me to think very differently about, you know, not, it's not just a collection of models, they interact with each other. And today, one is written in Java and Spark and this and that and it's not going to work. So we need to rethink the whole thing and build a single platform where every model can communicate with each other, right? Okay. So now let's talk about uh, 
uh, you know, you are here, you probably are going to be here for some more time, you're going to learn a variety of algorithms. And you'll wonder why the hell are there so many varieties of algorithms. It's pretty much the same question that a carpenter asks, you know, why are there so many tools? Why can't hammer be the only tool I need to know? Right? There's a reason for it. So we'll go through the tools and then we'll see how the big picture emerges. Right? So there's a class of algorithms that we call summarization algorithm. All you do there is you say, okay, uh, here's my customer data. Can you summarize it in some form to me? Don't just give me histograms and all that. Can you go one level deeper than histograms? Right? So then here what we did, we just clustered the people into 50 clusters by what they buy and this is a 10 year data. And now what can you do with it? You can take every cluster and say I'm going to send only those coupons to these people. So you can do a lot with very, very simple techniques. So we started with data, being a data company, to insights, to actions, right? Okay. So th there's a whole class of algorithm. You can summarize anything now, right? You can summarize your Twitter accounts, you can summarize Facebook, you can summarize web pages, you can even cluster your emails together. You can uh, cluster your customers together, your drivers together. You can, you can summarize everything, right? So there's a whole class and then you can do precise things with each cluster, right? Uh, another class of algorithms is what we call semantic algorithm. You know, kehna kya chate ho, right? What are you trying to say? So the idea is here what we did, we took a bunch of text uh, which is about, uh, you know, hotel reviews and we said to a machine, just go learn and whatever you can and then tell me the meaning of each word. And then we looked at the meaning of the word ambience and we wanted to know what did machine learn about the word ambience by just reading a lot of text data. It never went to a restaurant, right, obviously. <laughs> All right. So this is what it came up with. It said the word ambience means atmosphere, the wrong spelling of ambience. For a machine, nothing is a dictionary, right? Whatever data you give, it will believe that it's the data. Uh, relaxed atmosphere, music playing in background, all of this is ambience is what a machine learned just by reading what other people as a crowdsource were writing. So the words around ambience and the words around these words are similar, therefore these words must be similar. That's all it does and it can figure out that ambience is this, right? It can also do sentences. It can say that one sentence on the top is similar to all the other sentences. The grammar is not correct, spelling is wrong, this is human generated text and yet machines are able to take enough of that data and do this kind of a analysis and figure out what is similar to what. And that's what similarity is. If I ask a kid what is the meaning of this word, he will only give me similar meanings, right, and all that. So that's what machines can do. They can do this in text, in images, in songs and in many other domains, right. Another class of algorithm is what we call extraction, knowledge extraction algorithm, right? So if I give you a piece of text and say aspirin also known as blah, blah, blah and this, 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 you're going to read this like five times and say, tell me what you're really trying to say, right? Definition of a machine, right? And then what our brain does is it does this. It basically converts a piece of text to a knowledge graph and say, what are the entities you're talking about? What are the relationships you're talking about? Right? Is this a type of that? Is it causing this? Is it an attribute of this? And that's what your brain reads. This is what your eyes read. And the language center converts this to this. Right? And after this talk, you're not going to remember the words I spoke. You're going to have some knowledge graph transferred from one side to the other. Right? So you understand that? So that's what happens. Another class of algorithms is what we call interpretation algorithms. So they can interpret anything now. Right? So images, videos. So the next big thing in computer vision is video understanding, right? Image understanding, we know that we can recognize objects and stuff. The next thing here is, you know, is the dog sleeping or standing? The pose estimation, right? Is it a front facing car or side facing car? I need to know that if I have to cross the road. It's not enough to know that it is a car, right? Things like that. Uh, is it a wooden floor, right? So I should be able to do deeper image understanding and then go to video understanding, what kind of action is happening. So there's a lot of security applications for that, right, um, and all that. Then how do I interpret a tweet or a, or a review? It's not a simple text with a plus minus polarity sentiment analysis. You have to say which entity you are talking about, which aspect of that entity you are talking about, and then that aspect is it positive or negative, right? And you could be talking about the same hotel 
some aspects are positive some aspects are negative right you can say the price was good the food was spicy and the waiter was very ra rash and you know whatever right but the ambience was good so you can say five things about the same place and that is deep sentiment analysis right so we are able to do this kind of stuff with text now right another class of algorithm that we are learning anyway is a bunch of prediction algorithm right regression classification all of that so you can predict something and therefore you can prevent a bad thing from happening right uh, another class of algorithms we are learning is what we call uh, recommendation engines right and you know you've seen recommendation engines everywhere uh, for all kinds of stupid problems right make us a consumer right today we are not people we are consumers right? that's how amazons and flipkarts of the world think oh this is a consumer he will consume something let me make him consume more so we are using all this ai technology just to make us more consumers right not help, you know helping out great technology watch more movies netflix recommendation engine the whole world went crazy on netflix as a competition right what is the point of this right it's just a movie recommendation now the real recommendation engine we want to build is this right so imagine uh, one kid is good at these concepts the greens and not good at the oranges uh, and red and another kid is good at these concepts and not at the others right and the arrows are telling you what is the dependence of this concept on the next concept so if i know this well only then i can study this well and the bigger the arrow the more is the dependence right now this i already know this is the state of the two student what should i help you know give one student to study and the other right so let's say i ask the system tell me what should i have this kid learn next and it should be able to say you know 95 is the score for that concept because i know the dependence graph and that's what a, a personalized teacher would do he would know the kid and be able to do this right and then my so this is prediction right this is prediction machine learning and this is action which is okay what do i recommend now right this recommendation engine is very different from netflix and all that not just in purpose but also the way you will build it yeah okay another class of algorithm is what we call reasoning algorithm which is about the sequence of things i told you about the ola example and the driver and the long term reasoning right so that's a reasoning algorithm and by the way chatbot is not an nlp problem chatbot is a reasoning problem yeah you think about it you say uh, yeah you imagine you go to yatra.com and you say i want to go to delhi and the next thing it says is oh do you like uh, you know salman khan movies that would be a weird conversation right you have to have a proper ordering and sequence and relevance to what you say next so it's a reasoning problem what is the most optimal conversation to get the job done right so uh, and you know all the problem solving and all these are all reasoning problems all right so we have a zoo of algorithms right oh should i learn recommendation engine first or this first is this going to give me a better job or that right so we we think you know what the hell why are we having so many algorithms so now i'll tell you a, a a broader overview of why we need all this where do all these fit into a single picture right all right so here's an architecture of intelligence if you will right so we are all intelligent and we do this all the time we are all what we call a stimulus response system so what is stimulus stimulus is what you are hearing now is stimulus right your apps collect logs that is stimulus you know you you go to google and click it collects that data that is stimulus you make a phone call it gets collected it is stimulus stimulus is the data that you collect every day right what do you do with that data you analyze the data and you summarize it and you come up with the state of the system is your cardiac health 70% is your diabetic health 80% so you summarize all your transaction data what medicines you do how many steps you walk what do you eat that is transaction that is stimulus data you convert all of that into a bunch of numbers which is summarizing the state of the system your sibil score is a state of your financial state of your your score right uh, it is based on all your transaction data so stimulus to state you understand that okay and then uh, then what do we do with the state so i know that i am in this state now i want to move to this other state a better state right so i have this job i want to get a better job so i know my state i need to know what is the next action i take to get to a next state 
I do the same thing in chess, I do the same thing in education, I do the same thing everywhere, right? And then you manifest that action into the system. You go take the course, you know, you do all that. And then the stimulus leads to a response and then you get a feedback and the feedback tells you whether you understood the stimulus to state well, maybe not, whether you understood the, you know, reasoning well, convert the state to action or did you actually synthesize your answer correctly, right? All the three have to work in order for your feedback to be good. I will give you a very simple example. The most intelligent task that we all do every day is cross a road, right? Crossing a road is a stimulus response system. What is it a stimulus here? You know, you look at the car coming, you know, your eyes, your honking, you hear the honking, all of that is stimulus, right? You see a puddle on the road filled with water, all that is stimulus. Then what do you do? You analyze the stimulus and you say, is it safe to walk or not? Should I go over the bridge or should I cross on the road, right? Should I stay here, call a cab and take a U-turn or should I do something? So the idea is you now make a decision on the state to action. And then you, you then decide, okay, it's safe to walk. So safe is a state, right? Impossible is a state. You determine it's impossible to cross, right? So this is a state and then you synthesize that into a different kind of an action. Now if you don't run fast enough or slowly or whatever, then you know, you are not manifesting your action correctly. So the synthesis may be wrong. So the idea is unless all three are correct, you are not going to cross the road. Therefore, when you are not able to cross the road in the beginning, you fix all the three systems. You say maybe I did not estimate the car's speed well. So that is a stimulus to state model is improved. Similarly, if I am looking at my customer logs and I could not figure out that this customer was about to churn, so his churn score is one of the numbers in the customer state vector. And if I could not predict that well, I will miss it. He will lose, we will lose the customer. So maybe that part was not correct. Second is my reasoning was not correct. Why is he about to churn? What can I do about it? And then did you send him the right coupon? Did you give him the right offer? Maybe I understood he was about to churn. I understood the cause, but I did not give him the right response. You see, all three have to be correct to create a different future, right? All right, so where do AI algorithms fit in all this? So all of your machine learning algorithms fit either in this part or this part. So they are either a stimulus to state models, right? What are you trying to say in speech? What are you trying to say in, you know, through your click data? So this is your one class of models. They try to understand the input, convert stimulus to state. And this is where your key insights will come, right? Why is everybody talking about soil health card? It's a state of the soil, right? Can you figure out the state? So why do we have exams for kids every now and then? Because it gives me the state. Why do we do health checkups? The state. So, you know, the sensor data tells me the state and then it tells me what to do. On the other side, I have state to action algorithms, right? That's all you need to know. This is the only slide that will help you understand why there is all this mess out there and where does this algorithm fit, right? Okay. All right. So, where does machine learning really start? You know, people think, oh, I will learn Python and R and Spark and, de you know, decision trees and all that good stuff and now I am a data scientist. That is not a data scientist. This is, this has nothing to do with a data scientist, okay? So, the most important quality that I think a data scientist should have is this art of figuring out what is it that you are trying to optimize, right? So there's a very beautiful uh, saying in this, in this uh, movie, Alice in Wonderland, and she asks him, you know, uh, I'm lost, what do I do, which road do I take, and he says, where do you want to go, and she says, I don't know, where do I want to go, and then the cat says, then it doesn't matter, you can take any road, any road will take you there, right? So the beginning of data science is to know precisely what your metric is that you're trying to optimize, okay? Now, if you go to a company like Ola or Reliance or Google or somewhere, they, every product manager will have their own metrics, right? The guy will say, I want to minimize fraud. The guy will say, I want to maximize this. Everybody has their own metrics. But that is where the beginning of this whole thing is. So PMs are the best data scientists in that sense because they know how to think about the pain points, how do you convert that pain point into a metric or a set of metrics 
and say now how do I work backwards, right? So for example, downloading TensorFlow is not the beginning of data science. Defining what is churn is the beginning of data science. That's all I want to say, right? You can do TensorFlow today, tomorrow something fancy will come, but definition of churn kya hai is what is important, right? So you need to think about these things, right? What is a churn? Is 14 days, no call made, no visit to my store, is that churn? Why 14 days? Everybody will tell you 14 days and nobody knows why 14 days, right? Uh, what is a loan default? Is it 3 EMI is not paid is default? Who came up with that definition? Why does it even matter? And is the same definition valid for everybody? See, a farmer will earn income in a very different schedule. A barber will earn income in a very different schedule. How can you say that 3 month non EMI payment is same definition of default for everyone? This is where you have to combine your understanding of the domain with your idea of what the metric is, right? Uh, another one is what is a valid click? You know, this was a five year project in Google. Five years they took to figure out what the hell is a valid click. Search is not about matching problem and all that. It really starts with what is a valid click. A very simple example. If you click on a result given a query, you go to a page, you don't like what you see, you come back immediately. If you come back immediately, what does that mean? Although the system logged that it was a click, but it was an invalid click. So if you start to build search just because there was a click, you are going to build a bad search engine because the, the, this was telling you a negative click, right? You immediately came back is actually a minus one, not a plus one, right? So what is a valid click? Similarly in advertising, this is a huge problem in advertising, right? So imagine you are a Coke or a Pepsi and what do you do? You want to run out the other guy of all his ad money. What do you do? You hire a bunch of people in some tier 3 city in India, put them in front of a computer and say do this keyword search, right? And click the hell out of the other guy's ad, right? So they keep clicking, 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 no conversion happening. This is called click fraud in ads. It's a very big problem, right? And now this affects how Google charges the company and you know all of that, right? What is the valid click itself is the beginning of data science, right? You understand that. Uh, another one I'll tell you, right? Formulating an optimization problem. That is the core skill of a data scientist. What is it? How do you formulate this business problem into a machine learning problem, right? So I went to Ola and you know we talked to all the PMs, right? So we said PM of pricing comes and he says, you know, pricing is a big problem. If you fix pricing, everything will work out. Then the guy from drivers comes and he says, you know what, I don't know how to give the right incentive to the right driver to come at the right time on my platform. Can you optimize that? Then the other guy says, oh, can you allocate the right cap to the right person? Then somebody says, can you come up with a good strategy for customers acquisition? This is exactly the problem with a complex product 3.0 that every PM thinks in their own silos because they have been given their own metrics. What is the essence of this problem? It took me three months to figure out what are they all talking about really. There is only one problem in Ola or fleet management in Uber. There is only one problem. It is not about customer and driver. How do you extract the juice out of all this and say essentially you are solving this one problem. What is that one problem? If you can match the supply to demand in every location and time, you are done. That is the essential core problem. Now, how do you do it from a pricing angle? Well, if your price, you know, if your demand is high, supply is low, you increase the price, so your demand goes down. So you're still matching supply to demand, right? If you are doing allocation and you know that airport at 6 p.m. I need a lot of cabs, and here is a guy, and you know this customer wants to go to the airport, and this is going to reach there. So I'm I'm actually increasing supply at the right place through this allocation. You see, it's a supply demand matching problem. So the, the real skill in data science is to come up with that essential one problem that you solve, which solves all the other problems. You understand? The five blind men problem is what we have to deal with. Yeah? Okay. All right. Another interesting thing that has happened, good news, bad news thing, right? So there's a lot of open source out there, right? Everybody can get on to TensorFlow now. 
and you know we look at resumes and everybody is an expert in tensorflow and spark these days right and i wonder what was i doing right why am i not an expert yet now here's the problem you've seen this movie this is the incredible right so th this dialogue stuck me when i saw it for the first time and he said when everybody is super nobody is now you want to do a startup and you want to say i'm going to do swiggy better than swiggy right obviously we copy paste and try to do something fancy right i want to do you know medicine delivery better than one mg i want to do retail better than amazon i want to do something better than somebody right you go to a vc and you tell him hey vc i have figured out how to scale this to a million customers is this a real distinguishing point today right so today everybody has access to the cloud right you throw so much money you throw so much money you all get the same scale so scale is not a distinguishing factor now right okay what about ai everybody downloads the same open source software say doesn't matter where you go you talk to five people you get to know ah why care right okay, right everybody is downloading the same thing right they're not even tuning the model they're just using it it has become like a fad now almost right we're not inventing anymore we just learn the syntax and download and use it that also doesn't make you special as a company that doesn't make you special what else is the knowledge of spark and hadoop is that something so holy and profound that only brahmins know it no right everybody can figure this out so now that is also not what makes you special what the hell makes you special then why would you create a unique value for your customer in a crowded marketplace right so the only thing that makes you really special is what we call your label data label data not data your label data what makes google better than why google is better than bing if you will why do they have access to different people in the world no same people do they have different internets no it's the same internet why is one better than the other because one has more click data than the other right so this click data more than the other is the key to building a better search engine right remember we talked about the feedback feedback is the real innovation not all this tensorflow is great but the feedback creating collecting utilizing feedback to continuously improve your system is the key innovation in ai okay all right so now you know that you know why did google have you know i always wondered why google had to build a cell phone why the hell google went into the cell phone business does anybody have an idea it's not that they want to compete with apple and we also have to have a cell phone just because everybody else has a cell phone see how powerful this label data is right so google said oh, before the cell phone world you know there was everybody was using a mac or a pc most people were using a pc windows software right so when you are on a windows software you go to internet explorer you do a google search google search on internet explorer okay no no nothing wrong with that so far <laughs> so far nothing wrong now so whatever you are searching whatever you are clicking is the gold mine for google right for this query this customer clicked on this and stayed there for 3 minutes so that's a gold mine they want to know okay now microsoft started bing search engine big problem now microsoft owns internet explorer and if you own an infrastructure which is below the application microsoft can actually send that click data to microsoft bing then sundar pichai came up with this idea that we need to have our own browser so he, chrome chrome was invented not because we we didn't like internet explorer chrome was invented because data was going somewhere else then they said oh chrome is good what about the operating system so then they said chrome as a browser to chrome as an operating system they came up with chrome books laptops then they said oh the world has moved from laptops to phones we don't have a phone not only that we don't have a phone operating system so what if samsung and nokia and all these people will send my click data to those people and obviously those people are smart enough to collect the web the way we did but they also have our click data they get an undue advantage to do search better than us what do i do i say i want my own android 
operating system. Then they said operating system is not enough, I need my own phone because hardware level you can send it. You see just to make sure that this does not leak from any part of the cycle, you have to have your own device, your own operating system, your own browser and obviously your own app. Right? This is how well protected label data is. And now, you know, you should wonder why all these companies are so easily and liberally giving out AWS and all that stuff. Why would Amazon do that? Why would Netflix or whatever, right? Why would TensorFlow, Google release TensorFlow for everybody? Aren't they giving this undue advantage to others? No, because they know you cannot do anything with this unless you have label data. So the biggest problem in kickstarting a startup today is not that you don't have the green stuff, you all have the green stuff. The problem is it's a catch 22. All AI products have a catch 22 which is unless you have usage, you don't have label data, you cannot improve your product. If you cannot improve your product, you won't get customers. You won't get customer, you don't have usage and the cycle goes on. So you have to do something to break that cycle. Once you figure that out, that's it. What did Flipkart do? The great invention? cash on delivery. I said, let me break that, you know, I don't have data of who buys whom in India. Nobody had done e-commerce in India before, but they went after the essential problem in e-commerce in India was trust, right? If I order and you don't send and I pay, trust. India is full of mistrust, right? Nobody trusts anybody, right? So obviously, how can you trust some guy sending some product from somewhere, somebody bringing it, who, you know, you don't trust that guy, so cash on delivery, right? So like that, you have to identify the essential building block or bottleneck in your system and focus on that and then the loop builds. Once the loop starts to build, you will see an exponential growth. When VCs are asking for customer base, it's not just about the revenue, it's really about the data. And then they know that you're smart enough to figure out what to do with that data, right? Paytm. Paytm is not a payment company anymore. Paytm is a <laughs> sensor. They know, you know, when you pay, who you pay, what, how much you pay, and then they're saying, okay, can you buy tickets with us, movie tickets with us, flight tickets with us, lottery with us. So now, with that one entry point, they can expand into others. That's why payment is such a big deal. You know, uh, Google Pay, you know, Google realized this later, that, oh shit, we forgot the payment, we were building a sensor, right? <laughs> You know, why, why would we build payment? We are a free search engine, right? We don't need payment. So it was very, you know, bottom on their, on their mindset, right? All right. Uh, I'm still surprised Amazon has come up with Amazon Pay much later, right? Uh, all right. All right. So, um, you know, just to give you, an, you know, how important feedback data is, right? So a lot of people say, oh, I need storage, I need data. The real data that you need is the feedback data, right? So Google was built on search, right? In what context, what device, what are you searching, what are you clicking? YouTube is not about what you clicked, but how long did you watch that video? So there was a transition there, then they improved it. Amazon is not just about what product you bought, but they also capture how long did you stay on the page? You know, did you write a review? Did you read a review? Did you return a product? So your relationship with a product has multiple facets. Combine all of that into a single score and then build a recommendation, right? So most of your time should go into these kind of things, right? Not how do you make TensorFlow work on Java 8 or something nonsense like that, right? That's not what we do. All right. So the fonts are messed up, but essentially, you know, in any domain, if you want to think about AI and make it successful, five things you have to think about. What are the metrics I am going after? So in the retail, I am saying I want to maximize my profitability, revenue, whatever, right? What is the knowledge I have about the domain? Whatever domain it may be, insurance, you know, fintech, whatever it is, right? What do I already know about this domain, right? What is the data I'm collecting all the time? The stimulus data, point of sale data. What is the state that I can derive from that stimulus data? This is the first AI component in your system. Everything else so far is just knowledge gathering and all that other stuff. First intelligent thing you do is stimulus to response. And every kid knows exactly that this is the first intelligent task, right? They'll throw a piece of glass, break it, look at the mother, stimulus, response, feedback, they know that a slap is coming, right? So that's how AI systems work. 
everything else is, is, is processed, right? And then we know what the stimulus and the response is. And then here, what are my responses? When do I take them, right? So just remember these five things. If I have to improve my refineries, what do we do? We define the metric first, right? And say, what is it that you're really trying to define? And then, uh, you know, what do I know about my plant? I know every chemistry of every, you know, chemical that goes in comes out. What are my sensor data? What is the state of the, every part of the plant, right? Is it healthy or not? Is the catalyst weak or not? Whatever it is. And then what should I do with it, right? Another one is agriculture is the same thing. What are my metrics? So I want to maximize crop yield and minimize the expenses. I want to also have the long-term effect of healthy soil, right? I know a lot of things about agriculture, right? Uh, now, the real problem in agriculture and healthcare and education is not that they are unworthy problem. They are actually very beautiful, big, large problem. The reason why Google is succeeding and Amazon is succeeding and others are succeeding and why agriculture is not succeeding. What is the reason? Do we not know how to do AI in agriculture? We know how to do AI in agriculture also. What is missing is the data we are not collecting. Imagine if I knew every crop, every stage, every week, if I imagine a farmer can tell me what's going on in his crop, if I have satellite data, if I have soil IoT data, if I have weather data, and I can tell exactly you know, what's going on, that is the kind of data I would need to bring AI to agriculture, right? Same, same thing is the problem with education also, right? So then what is the state of the entities that I have and what do I do with them, right? Education is the same thing. What is the metric I'm trying to learn? What do I know? The prerequisite graph we talked about. What is the stimulus? Again, this is what is not there. Stimulus data makes all the difference, right? So what is the stimulus data in education? Hey, this kid is watching this video from this time stamp to this time stamp, he's rewinding again and again. That tells you something, right? He is able to solve this kind of problem, but not this kind of problem. On the third step, this concept is needed. He is asking for a hint. That means he doesn't know. See how, how fragile and how beautifully you have to collect sensor data, not for generating logs and reports, but to understand the user or the customer or the crop or whatever, right? And then you, understand, you know, build states like we did the state, right? The diagram I showed you earlier is a state of learning of a student. And then you define what video to give him, what problem to give him and all that, right? All right. So, you know, in one of my talks, I talked about AI. Education is actually the biggest big data problem, not Google search or Amazon. If you look at the numbers, Amazon sells 30 million orders a day. Google does 3.5 billion queries a day. You know how much data education can generate if we capture it? So if you do a simple math, imagine every kid does five subjects. Every subject, he solves, let's say, five problems a day. Every problem, he has five steps. And you know, you capture every step and like five parameters on every step. Did he take a hint? Did he ask for help? Did he copy from Google? Whatever, right? And then you can actually, if you collect that much of data, there's a lot of data that can be generated in education, but we haven't spent enough time doing it. We haven't digitized education yet. We're still doing you know, notebooks and that data is getting lost, right? Same thing in healthcare. You know, you go to a doctor, he writes in some weird format and nobody knows what he writes. Pharmacy guy gives you something, you eat and whether you die or go to a hospital, nobody knows. Nobody knows the feedback, right? So there's no continuum in that. Therefore, electronic health record is important. That's the beginning of how do we transform healthcare, right? So data collection and then utilization. So every sector you will see is behind is because we haven't put enough sensors to collect the right data from it. So you don't go say, no, no, first I'll only work on problems where there is enough data, right? Stock market prediction, there's enough data there. Is it a worthy problem to solve just because there's enough data there, right? So think differently. All right, so let me skip this. We've talked about uh, all our quite a bit. All right, so now let me question another dimension of AI, which is, you know, we're learning all these things as if they are God-given things, right? Decision tree is the best thing in the world and whatever, right? Because some Somebody said so, therefore, right? We have stopped the art of thinking, is this how humans do it, right? So my fundamental thesis about AI is, 
it's not enough that you get the same accuracy as the humans have what is important is do you learn the way humans do you see the difference i don't want to say that we are 80 percent accurate you know therefore you know the way a, a, a radiologist learns about how to understand radiology images is very different than how a vision system learns how to classify radiology images accuracy may be higher because that guy is tired or whatever but is ai heading in the right, right direction in that sense right so uh, you know even jeff hinton is sick and tired of this deep learning deep learning now he's like hell with all this i'll start all over again right and then he's doing something new now so let me give you a few examples of why i think ai is not heading in the right direction so uh, at some point you are probably going to study word embeddings so embeddings is a way to represent a word in a vector and you know if it's a mathematical construct you can always take cosine similarity between any two vectors right and say this is similar to that but if you don't think about it you can say you know these are all similar i can actually compute these similarities whether they mean anything or not i can actually compute these similarities so the word embedding the you know saying that everything should have the same embedding and all words should be in this space is a wrong idea the only embeddings that should be allowed are embeddings about same types of things you can only compare taj mahal with eiffel tower not even with agra that's not similarity you understand how fine grain we should think about is this how we do machine translation so i have my machine translation guy here uh, uh, and you know he tells me this is not how we do machine translation right humans don't do machine translation by reading parallel corpus in two languages right what do we do we read one language we create a graph out of it and then we can speak that graph in any language so it's via the graph that we learn how to translate not from sentence to sentence but for the longest time what people have been doing oh we want to build machine translation between english and french let's look at one english sentence one french sentence do this parallel corpus business and we'll learn machine translation yes you may get a good accuracy but this is not how humans learn machine translation you understand that ai is delivering the right kind of results in a completely wrong way right the method is weird now this problem is so important now if i want to build a machine translation system for all indian languages right how will i do it how many people here know more than three or four languages right few people know four languages maybe right your mom is from here your dad is from here you grew up in the third state and you're now a completely crazy fellow so you know five languages right you completely confused so that's that's good right but now tell me how many people in india know punjabi and uriya three of them i can't find them right how will i create a parallel corpus you understand why machine translation has not succeeded because there is no parallel corpus now is that the right way to do it no can i do it another way and then create machine translation for india yes do i actually need this parallel corpus only for verification not for learning can i get there right why has google not built it yet it's looking for that parallel corpus who will give it that parallel corpus right so everybody is stuck on this oh i know this approach it has worked for english and french it should work for any other language no that's not even how humans do it right so these are the real challenges in in data science right don't take a western approach on a data rich problem and try to apply it to our problems which are data hungry the same tensor flow will not work here it's not about the tensor flow anyway it's like saying do i send my email using mac or 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 a pc that's not important right okay all right so so you know just to continue to question the fundamentals right is this how we learn to see you know how we teach our deep learning systems to see recognize cats what do we do we say this is a cat here is an image and a label data right this is a dog this is tens of thousands of label data now imagine your baby wakes up one day and you say hey baby wake up look this is a cat now go to sleep look this is a dog and by the way let's do this for the next 20 years right now you learn vision is that how we learn vision no right how many images of dogs have you seen before you recognize it's a dog very few just few examples is enough right if i tell my daughter that's an auto 
or that's a bullock card once, so you will understand what's a bullock card. So there is something fundamentally wrong in the way we are, you know, teaching our machines to see. It's very different from, you know, how we learn to see. So it's not enough to say, yeah, yeah, we have reached 90 percent accuracy. That's a nonsense <laughs> metric. How have you done it? Well, you have thousands of Indians labeling images for you here. In Hyderabad, we have these big shops where people come and they label data. And then you take all the label data, you put some big brute force algorithm like 100 layers of deep learning and billions of parameters and a whole cloud, you know, that takes the power of a whole city. And then say, yeah, look, we have built a beautiful complex deep learning system, how great AI is. Is that great, really? I mean, that's not AI, right? I, I think something is fundamentally wrong. Uh, another example, do we learn to hear and do we learn to speak as two different things? Have you noticed that dumb, you know, deaf people have a hard time speaking and dumb people have a hard time hearing what you're saying, right? Why? Because we learn to speak and listen at the same time. We train our vocal cords and our olfactory system, uh, our, our hearing system at the same time. When I speak in the phone and I don't hear myself back, you feel weird about it, right? And we hear ourselves all the time and that's how we learn to speak and pronounce. You have seen how music people, right, they listen to themselves very, very carefully and they improve their vocal cords because they listen to themselves. This idea of completing the loop of synthesis and analysis together is what AI system is going to look like. But today what happens, there is a speech group which does speech to text in Alexa in one room and text to speech in the other room. There are two different problems. And they just apply the same deep learning and all the label data. That's not how speech is supposed to be done, right? So, you know, I keep questioning all this and say, does more data and more parameters mean more intelligence? I wanted to think about it. We all going crazy about deep learning and all that good stuff and big data and all that. We started with that. But really, you know, if I had to give this lecture three times to you in three different ways and then also you are not getting it, are you intelligent or dumb? That's what we are doing with the machines, right? We are not really creating intelligent machines because we are not teaching them how to learn from less data. We are forcing them to learn from lots of data in the wrong way. So AI needs a completely different direction now, yeah? Okay, so the last part of my talk, I want to talk about you know, the use cases and every technology is good or bad, not because of the technology itself, but because of the use cases, right? We can use a nuclear bomb to kill a million people or to generate electricity. We can use a gun to defend the borders or kill innocent people. It's not the gun's fault. Similarly, people talk about the perils of AI and the goods of AI and all that. It's about how we use it. And today, what have we done with AI so far? We have done search engines. We have done recommendations on Amazon, five things we have done, right? I'll show you a few more things we have done. And uh, is, this is a video, can you play it? If you move your mouse on this. So this is from Let's Google. Let's say you want to ask Google to make you a haircut appointment. So what you're going to hear is the Google Assistant actually calling a real salon to schedule the appointment for you. What's still happening out here? Hi, I'm calling to book a woman's haircut for a client. Um, I'm looking for something on May 3rd. Sure, give me one second. Mm -hmm. sure, so this is the level of uh, speech to text. Di this is called Actually, dialogue manager, yeah. right? So dialogue managers are very domain specific the dialogue. The closest manager. we have to that is a 115. If you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m., Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? All right. The first name is Lisa. All right. Okay, so perfect. Let's pause. Let's say you want. All right. So that's the best Google could come up with after spending trillions of dollars on speech, language, chatbot all of that, right? What I'm saying is technology is great, but if you use it to book haircut appointments uh, or to order pizza or to tell Alexa to change your channel or to buy stuff online, if that is the use case that 
you can come up with, you should not be doing all this. It is not worth it, right. Now I am going to show you the real use cases of AI. And the, the message here is, you know, West has created a lot of beautiful technology, right. But they are now running out of use cases. Because their education system is already good, healthcare is already good, farming is already good. So for them, those are not the real problems. For them, the real problems is still personalization of education. Because yes, I have a very good education system at 90 percent, how do I take it to 95 percent? India's is at 20 percent. For us, what speech means is not this. I will tell you what speech means for India if you will, right. So let's, let's say you want. So in 2011, we attended, uh, you know, this is a big conference, WWW, and Dr. Abdul Kalam was the keynote speaker there, right. And he said two very interesting things and he is talking to all this AI community of the world, right. So, so he said, I am confident that future interactions with the computer will be more seamless and human, not, you know, clicks and apps and menus and all this nonsense, right. He said that five years before Siri came, okay. Then in the Indian context, he said the biggest problem in AI is going to be this, this idea of language understanding, right. And obviously the idea that all our, edu you know, agriculture experts are, you know, English educated or few languages and the guy is calling from some remote corner of India, there is a language problem. Even with a human to human, forget AI. What kind of AI will make sense for us to do? So what AI does for India is very different than what AI has to do for the West. So don't even think about Western use cases. You know, you, you need to start looking at, you know, can I improve mobility in my city? Can I improve, uh, you know, environment? Can I improve education and healthcare and, uh, you know, poverty elimination? These are the real problems where AI has never been tried before, never tried before. Because the people who invented it didn't see these as problems, right? So we have to do this ourselves, right. So now let me uh, play one more video, uh, audio. So there is this audio thing now, just click on it, play it. So this is a, this is a chat between a farmer and an expert. बताइए बसंत जी क्या जानकारी चाहिए सर हमको सोयाबीन की बाउनी के लिए बीज उपचार करने की टेक्नोलॉजी चाहिए सर टेक्नोलॉजी चाहिए सो ही नोस सम इंग्लिश वर्ड्स एंड ठीक है मिक्स लैंग्वेज मैं जोड़ रहा हूं जो बता पाएंगे आप उनसे ये बोल दीजिएगा बोलिएगा कि बीज उपचार कैसे करते हैं ना मैं जोड़ता हूं दिस इज कॉल्ड क्वेरी अंडरस्टैंडिंग इन गूगल वर्ड व्हाट टाइप ऑफ क्वेरी इट इज सो ही इज कनेक्टिंग टू द राइट एक्सपर्ट थोड़ा सा स्किप करिए नहीं नहीं थोड़ा कम थोड़ा पीछे और थोड़ा पीछे हेलो जी सर हाँ बोलिए जी क्लिक कर दो ओप्स सॉरी हाँ स्टिक ना कौन से जिले से बोल रहे हैं वाली ये वाले जिले से बोल रहे हैं तेजी लास्ट का सर अच्छा तो क्या शुभ नाम आपका और गांव बता दीजिए why is this important? Context is important. Where is he calling from matters. Which one is the beach? 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 आयरन दो ग्राम और कार्बन डाइजिन एक ग्राम ऐसे तीन ग्राम प्रति किलो बीज के हिसाब से करें जी है ना और आठ से दस ग्राम ट्राइकोडर्मा विल्डी ले और जी जी सर सो यू गट द पॉइंट नाउ हाउ डू यू बिल्ड दिस चैट पार्ट यू अंडरस्टैंड एंड हाउ डू यू बिल्ड इट इन ऑल इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस सो व्हाट ऑल टेक्नोलॉजीज डू आई नीड टू बिल्ड अ चैट बॉट लाइक दिस राइट सो आई नीड टू हैव स्पीच अंडरस्टैंडिंग इन ऑल इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस आई नीड टू हैव लैंग्वेज अंडरस्टैंडिंग इन ऑल इंडियन लैंग्वेजेस and imagine on the back side today with humans I can do only 800 calls a day and it's expensive right their time and they have to be on the call all the time anytime somebody can call imagine if there's an AI system doing this right it has to be knowledgeable in in agriculture right so there's a knowledge graph there's a speech there's a language and then there is this dialogue manager right 
this is the depth at which we really need AI to perform, right? Because that's where the real use cases are. They are not in haircut appointments or ordering pizza, right? So the depth of AI is, is where we need to go to, right? So what we are doing in, in the center of excellence, we are saying, you know what, the, the Americans and the Chinese have the, their own AI stack, right? They know how to do English well and they know how to do Chinese well. But there's nobody in India who knows how to do the 20 Indian languages well, right? Speech, language, right? We don't have parallel corpus to build uh, translation. So in every sense of the word, India is a very AI poor country from technology and data and resource perspective. But we are a very rich country from a use case perspective. We have all the use cases that you can think of, but we are, we are struggling with the data layer for example, right? Uh, but technology wise we can do whatever, right? So we need to think like that, that unless we build these infrastructures of speech and language in all, all Indian languages and all, this is what I call the AI stack for India. Yeah? Then on top of it, now at least we think in terms of two customers. One is a Reliance is a customer. Reliance is 6% of India's GDP. Anything you do to improve Reliance businesses, retail and this and that, it improves the GDP. And the other is India is our customer. Not India, the Bharat is our customer. So we have 30% of us and the 70% of the rest of it, right? How do they understand an English menu? For them, speech is not really about cool, right? It's about inclusion. So if you don't do speech-based interfaces, they won't come online, right? They don't know what's an app or download a YouTube video. They know how to speak and that's all they do. So they're looking for a 1-800 number. That's all they are looking for. Rest of it is our problem. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, let me just conclude. So, you know, the general guideline, the principles are that I've learned is, one is, you know, we keep thinking, remember I said in Ola, the core problem is match supply with demand. Then I come to Geo and they say, you know, supply creates demand. This is the antithesis of everything you've learned in a business school, right? And you look at, look around, right? When we create roads, people start using them, right? When we create universities, people start joining them. When we create cheap data network, people start using it. You understand? Supply actually creates demand. You cannot say, no, no, farmers don't need AI. Or tier 3 villages don't need AI. Only the rich people, English speaking with a wallet needs AI. Because we are lazy enough not to even change our channel. That's all we need to do, right? And everybody is like working on those problems, right? That's not what we need to do. So supply creates demand. So think about that. Uh, think holistic solutions. Yes, you're going to learn individual tools, right? You're going to learn a hammer and a jack and this and that. You're going to learn the bottom level tools, but that's not what your real skill is. Any Tom, Dick and Harry, a 12th grader in the next two years will know what is TensorFlow. You're already out of date. I'm already out of date by 20 years. Technology is moving too fast. What is our real skill is to think solutions top down and say, if I want to change education system, what are the 200 things we need to do? And out of those 200, which five are AI driven? And others are connectivity, the, you know, we need to build devices, we need to whatever, right? Uh, think solution, then see where your models fit into them, right? Another one is uh, find real use cases, right? Don't try to come up with a weird use case that you copy pasted from a Chinese store. And, you know, think very differently about AI. We are always conditioned by, oh, look at what the Chinese are doing with their AI, right? What the Americans are doing with their AI. We don't need to be copy pasting the use cases. We have enough of them. And the way India will benefit from AI is very different than the way they are using AI use cases, right? So we need to think differently about our use cases. And that's where our real strength is, right? And the last thing I, I talk about is, yes, India will benefit from AI, but AI will benefit from India a lot more, right? What do you need in a data set? You need diversity. You need variance. Where is variance in this world? <laughs> Just look at this room. There are 20 languages people speak here. That is variance. India is going to create a new kind of AI because of this diversity, yeah? All right, I'll stop here, take any questions. All right, any questions? Anything you want to comment? 
don't look for a job in Goldman Sachs, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> the essence of what I'm saying is don't go to Goldman Sachs. They don't need you. Right? So we are always hiring. If you want to join us, right, uh, geo.ai at ril.com. You can send your resumes. Uh, we have a big charter, right? And you know we have openings for all kinds of things. If you are a solution thinker, if you are a big data engineer, if you are a speech person, if you want to work in uh, education or healthcare, if you want to improve the refineries, you are a time series forecasting person. No matter what your expertise or interest is, or what you want to learn next, you know we have a wide variety of things with which we want to do. Yeah? All right. Thank you so much. Yeah.